A posse of Colombians is cruising the streets of Miami. They're part of a notorious gang known as the Cocaine Cowboys. Their destination, the Dadeland shopping mall. Their target, a liquor store. Their mission, to take out a rival cocaine dealing gang. When the cops arrive, they're shocked by the brazen daytime execution. Two known cocaine dealers dead, and two innocent store clerks critically wounded. The disregard for human life there at the scene was something that we had never seen or heard of here in South Florida. For Nelson Andrew, a young detective with the Miami police, it's a baptism of fire. I was in as a homicide detective within 10 months of graduating the police academy. I mean, I was a rookie policeman shaking in my boots. The cops find a specially modified van which they believe belongs to the assassins. The vehicle that they had abandoned, the war wagon that was covered with bulletproof vests to make it almost like an armored vehicle. Inside, there's an arsenal of deadly high-tech weapons. Police officers were still using six-shot revolvers, and these guys had Uzi submachine guns. So the police department itself were not prepared for that. The victims are Colombian drug dealers, so police search for information in Miami's Colombian immigrant community. Why did this happen? We didn't know at the time. We didn't even know who the shooters were. But no one has the courage to speak out. Very, very difficult to get any type of information from these Colombians. They were very tight-lipped. Because the massacre is part of something much bigger. It was a Wild West show down here, and that was really sort of exhibit A, the Dadeland murders. Gangland warfare has been raging across the city for three years. Miami saw dramatic changes in the homicide rate. Um, we went from probably 80 to 100 murders a year to almost three to 400. We would just find the bodies shot in cars or restaurants or wherever it was. It's the worst violence in any US city since the bloody era of Al Capone. A hundred thousand criminals, 350 rival gangs, slaughtering each other for a piece of the action. The victims all meet an especially violent death. Overkill. You can shoot a person one time in the head and they're gonna die, but they would shoot you 10 times. And all are involved in Miami's booming new trade. Cocaine was being imported by the ton, by boat, by plane, in cargo. No longer a high-priced celebrity party drug, cocaine is fueling a new epidemic of organized crime. It's on the streets, easily available and destroying millions of American lives. In Miami, cops are determined to find out which Colombian kingpin is behind the violence. They pull in street corner dealers, grilling them for information about their suppliers. Threatened with jail time, the dealers start to talk, and they all whisper, the same name. That's when Griselda Blanco emerged. The crime boss orchestrating this rampant drug war is a woman. A Colombian native named Griselda Blanco. She was the largest cocaine importer of the, at the time. Known in cities across the US as the Godmother. 
for her mafia-like brutality. One of the most feared narcotics homicidal maniacs that we've ever encountered. I should say late 70s in Miami that she really begins to emerge as this female Al Capone. If she owed you money and didn't want to pay you, she'd kill you. If you owed her money, she'd kill you. Sometimes she would just kill you for the fun of it. To trace Blanco's transformation into the violent, bloodthirsty woman who will earn the name the Black Widow, you have to go back over 25 years. Griselda Blanco is a slum kid, growing up in Medellin, Colombia's second largest city. Her community of Barrio Antioquia is a ghetto of gangsters, prostitutes, and killers. She lived in a neighborhood that was so uniquely criminal that it had been designated a tolerance zone, which is to say a red light district, by the city. Things that were illegal elsewhere were legal in that little neighborhood. Griselda begins her life of crime as a pickpocket. But then she steps it up. Legend has it, at the tender age of 11, she kidnaps a boy her own age from an upscale neighborhood. She holds him for ransom. His parents don't take her threats seriously. Without a second thought, she takes his life. A cold-blooded killer even before she hits her teens it's a mark of what she's prepared to do to get what she wants. This was another level of killing that cannot be explained by anything I think in her background. I think it's something in her soul. She was a born criminal. At 13, Griselda gets a boyfriend the much older, Carlos Trujillo. He's a Colombian people trafficker. Over five years, he teaches Griselda the dark art of passport forgery, and she becomes expert in creating fake identities. Together, they organize the illegal smuggling of thousands of people into the United States. I believe he was her one true love. He taught her a lot. He certainly taught her how to smuggle. By the time she's 19, Griselda and Carlos Trujillo are married with three sons. They divide their time between Colombia and New York. But when in 1970, Trujillo dies suddenly and suspiciously of liver failure, Griselda takes center stage. At 27, Griselda should be a grieving widow, but Trujillo has served his purpose, and she has already lined up his replacement, another gangster named Alberto Bravo. She forges relationships with men early on that are beneficial to her economically and then socially. Bravo doesn't smuggle people, but cocaine. Blanco sees there's serious money to be made. And that money is in the United States. But Bravo's drug business is small time. A few smugglers trafficking trivial amounts of cocaine. Blanco has much bigger ambitions for overhauling the drug trade and building a cocaine empire in America.
Bravo and Blanco are this perfect partnership. And they're in the right place at the right time with the right product. Criminal mastermind Griselda Blanco and her drug dealing lover are poised to take the United States by storm and spark an unprecedented crime wave that will sweep from coast to coast. Colombian drug traffickers Griselda Blanco and Alberto Bravo move their headquarters from Medellin, Colombia to the Big Apple and hit the big time. Their aim, to make billions by controlling cocaine smuggling into American cities. Griselda Blanco has a vision to build herself a criminal empire. With her network of illegal Colombian dealers already operating within the United States, she has a ready-made distribution network in place. Now all she has to do is come up with a way to import the cocaine in mass quantities. First step, Griselda Blanco's lover and business partner, Bravo, buys cocaine in Bolivia and Peru and transports it across the unguarded borders to Colombia. There, it gets repackaged in Blanco's hometown of Medellin. As a woman in a man's world, her masterstroke is to devise a new way of smuggling the cocaine into the US. Stashed where no one would think to look. They were creating garments. These garments would allow for the drugs to be more smooth around the body. It would just look like a woman's natural figure. She selects only Colombian women as her mules and trains them to flaunt their sexuality to distract the border guards. She encouraged the women to dress very attractively, to be um, flirtatious with customs agents and immigration agents. The drug mules carry the cocaine aboard flights to the US. Each woman holds a kilo of cocaine, $10,000 in net profit. To the average customs officer, Blanco's drug mules are just especially voluptuous women. No one's going to suspect that a young woman who's very nicely dressed is going to be wearing a bra padded with cocaine. The mules touch down in New York, where Griselda's underground network of Colombian distributors lie waiting. Within hours, the cocaine hits the streets. The new tidal wave of cocaine gets the attention of New York's police department and the Drug Enforcement Administration. They set up an undercover operation to hunt down the source. Operation Banshee. One of their finest agents is Robert Nieves. Puerto Rican American born and raised in Brooklyn, New York, and recruited by the DEA. His partner is Bob Palombo, a Spanish speaking narcotics expert, investigating the Colombian drug trade for three years. Two years into the operation, Nieves and Palombo get a break they arrest a small-time dealer. Threatened with 30 years in prison, he sees no option but to talk. Informants were working off a nut. What we mean by that when we say working off a nut is he's facing serious prison time, and he doesn't want to go to jail. And so he agrees to cooperate with the government. The motivating factor, more often than not, is the ability to shave some time off of their jail sentence. The dealer says his supplier is a woman, Lila Parada. Lilia Parada worked within the organization. She was a distributor. She's identified fairly early on as being involved by the NYPD. Nieves and Palombo quickly realize Parada is not a big fish. 
but she could still reveal vital information on the true Mastermind's distribution network. So they wire her apartment. We were listening to conversations real time on targeted telephones. In those days, we didn't have sophisticated software. That didn't exist. The software was a pen and paper, and there were log books. Making sense of what they hear is not as simple as it seems. The detectives listening to the wiretaps and involved in the case had to speak fluent Spanish. But the Spanish is all in code. Spanish is Spanish, but the Colombians, especially Colombian traffickers, have their own in Spanish argot. It's slang. They had certain codes. Somebody has left the funeral. This might mean that cocaine was en route to New York. Beautiful children with good bones meant high 100% cocaine with crystal. So not only are they speaking in guarded terms and camouflaging their conversation by talking about the children, talking about this or that, but they're also speaking in a jargon that's unique to the neighborhood they grew up in Medellin. And so it became very difficult uh, at times to really get the gist of the conversation. Worse still, all the names are fake. The Colombians then, as now, always operated with aliases. Nobody would ever use their real name. They had very good false ID, from driver's licenses to passports multiple names associated with those documents. You never knew who you had in custody. But in the transcripts, two code names appear more than others. The DEA identifies them as Carmen and Gloria Caban, their sisters already serving time for cocaine trafficking. As veteran drug mules, they must know key players in the Colombian cocaine network. There were two girls that were locked up on state charges who were closely associated with the hierarchy of these people from Medellin. Agent Nieves pays a visit to the older sister. Carmen Caban. But even from a secure prison cell, Caban refuses to talk. If I could compare their fear, uh, it would be the kind of fear that the first informant who talked about Al Capone felt. So Nieves makes her an offer. Where is it? Placement in witness protection and the chance of seeing her family again. I don't know how many years the Caban sisters were facing, but the likelihood of her seeing family members was not likely at all. It's an offer she can't refuse. Caban reveals the names of 37 Colombians dealing drugs in New York alone. Then she finally delivers the name of the ruthless criminal mastermind behind it all. Griselda Blanca. It was surprising at that time uh, to hear of a woman who was running a criminal organization, engaged on a violent end of the business, the person who resolved everything with a gun. It's the breakthrough Nieves and Palombo have worked for two years to achieve. Now they have enough evidence to indict Blanco and her henchmen with mass-scale drug trafficking. There's only one problem. They have no idea what this matriarchal manipulator looks like. We couldn't find a photograph of Griselda Blanco, so she was just a name. Blanco is untraceable because she makes use of every trick her dead first husband, the forger Trujillo, taught her. She comes and goes using a different fake identity every time. How are you going to arrest somebody who is moving in and out of the country, moving under 
false documents, has multiple aliases and identities, and you don't even have an image of that person. When she gets word that the DEA are closing in on her criminal gang, she goes underground and completely disappears. She would be in the wind. She might be back in Colombia. I don't think there was any hope that they would ever be able to find her again. In Colombia, she's out of reach and nearly impossible to trace. It's a major defeat for the DEA. But what Nieves and Palombo don't know is they're not the only ones gunning for Griselda Blanco. The head of a ruthless new gang begins to muscle in on Griselda Blanco's territory. His name, Pablo Escobar. And he poses a much greater threat than any of her previous rivals. He wasn't afraid of her. Everyone else was, but he wasn't. Escobar will become known as the king of cocaine, the wealthiest criminal in history, responsible for transforming Bogota, Colombia, into the world's murder capital. But first, he has to confront the fearsome Griselda Blanco. Already by about 1975, she and Pablo were fighting, literally trying to kill one another. Each had his or her team of assassins after the other. Blanco realizes if she is to defend her vast cocaine empire against serious competition, she needs to ramp up her violent tactics in the ultimate show of force. On the streets of Medellin, Blanco develops what becomes her signature method of assassination. The motorcycle drive-by. Her brazen methods keep Escobar at bay, while she delights in her power to kill. For six years, Blanco and Alberto Bravo have made an invincible team. But their relationship eventually starts to sour. Blanco believes rumors Bravo has been skimming profits and having an affair. Killing Bravo earns her a new nickname. She was like the Black Widow. She made it and then she killed her mate. The nickname the Black Widow fit her very well. Word hits the streets the Black Widow will stop at nothing in her quest for criminal supremacy. But one foe still stands in her way. Colombian rival Pablo Escobar now has more than just a foothold in Blanco's territory. Undaunted by the Black Widow's reputation, Escobar kills police and bribes officials to secure Medellin Airport as his own. It strangles her main distribution route to the United States. Pablo Escobar made it impossible for her to be in Medellin. 
on the run from the DEA in New York and muscled out of her Colombian hometown by rival Pablo Escobar. Griselda Blanco, the mistress of disguise, once again vanishes into thin air. Three years into Operation Banshee, and the DEA's search for the Black Widow in New York has gone stone cold. They wonder if she's got out of the cocaine business, or maybe even been killed. But then in 1976, events a thousand miles away in Florida give agents a brand new set of leads. Organized crime sweeps through Florida's haven of sun and sand, Miami. The DEA begins to think the Black Widow may no longer be on the run, but back on US soil. What's more, informants reveal her aliases to customs officials. At last, the DEA can put a face to the name Black Widow. In 1979, at the Dadeland Mall, the Cocaine Cowboys gang brutally assassinate their rivals in broad daylight. The over-the-top violence bears the hallmarks of a Black Widow hit. Now the Florida police believe she has set up her headquarters in Miami and is single-handedly triggering bloody gang warfare that sort of came to symbolize the lawlessness of what was going on in Miami. It really embodied the deterioration of law and order and the overwhelming impact that drug dealing was having on the city. The Miami police are soon swamped. There weren't the cops, there weren't the agents, uh, they didn't have the information, they didn't have the resources. I mean, there were no facilities available to stem this and the distribution was extremely violent. Soon after, something happens to confirm law enforcement's suspicions that Blanco is behind it all. A young detective with the Miami police is called to the scene of a shooting at the home of a Colombian family, the Lorenzos. His name? Nelson Andrew. You could tell that there had been a struggle in the house because of the blood that's in the carpeting. You can tell that people were, had been shot and were running. Andrew has been working homicide for around a year. Bringing the perpetrators to justice becomes his mission, no matter the personal cost. Missed birthdays, missed Christmas, Thanksgiving, anniversaries. You get called out at 3 o'clock in the morning in the middle of the night, and this happens over and over and over again. And you're only dealing with bad people, bad situations, death of sometimes of children. It was just too much, too quick, something that we weren't ready for as a police department, we weren't ready for as a city, but it was here. But this is no routine homicide. The Lorenzos are cocaine dealers. And their killers came looking for revenge. They're tied up. They have belts. They have telephone cords that are used to tie them up. They were both shot multiple, multiple times, I think three or four times each in the, in the torso and in the head. The evidence of torture, the violent overkill, the links to cocaine. It leaves the DEA in no doubt. The Black Widow is back and more deadly than ever. You know, that's the way she operated. She resolved all, all problems with a hit. During her Florida reign of terror, the Black Widow orders as many as 200 revenge attacks.
Every month, her empire ships more than 3,400 pounds of cocaine into the country. Her distribution network spans the entire US and makes her $80 million monthly. The Miami cops and the DEA know the Black Widow is behind the slaughter on the streets, but they have no idea from where she's running the show. We knew that she was alive and we knew that she was in operation, but you know, how she was running the operation, where the principal players were, uh, that we did not know. To bring her to justice, first they have to lure her from her hiding place, then set a trap to gather airtight evidence against her. What they learn from informants on the streets sparks an entirely new strategy. She had installed each of her three older sons, Uber, Osvaldo, and Dixon in each of the three major areas of her distribution, San Francisco, Los Angeles, and Miami. The Black Widow now has so many enemies, the only people she can really trust are her own flesh and blood. On one level, drug businesses are family businesses, because who else can you really trust? Now the DEA team thinks they can turn the Black Widow's strength into her weakness. If they can somehow gain the trust of one of her sons, then they may just be able to get the insider information they so desperately need to bring her whole drug smuggling operation crashing down. DEA agent Bob Palumbo has spent 10 years on Blanco's trail from New York to Miami. Now he needs to position an informant at the heart of Blanco's family network. We really had to have somebody inside the organization, which was very, very difficult because this was an extremely close-knit group. These people don't deal with strangers. She's only going to deal with people that she knows. Finally, in April 1983, Palombo gets the opportunity he's been waiting for. Serving time for narcotics trafficking, the DEA finds a Colombian who might just give them access to Blanco's inner family circle. His name is Jerry Gomez. He is a businessman who knows Blanco's three sons with first husband, Carlos Trujillo. Gomez had run a motorcycle shop in Medellin, Colombia, and had sold Blanco's sons some motorcycles. We felt he could make a credible approach to them. The plan is to release him from his 10-year stretch and send him undercover. Gomez is to approach one of Blanco's sons, offering to launder money for them across their national network. If Jerry could weave his way into the confidence of even just one of the sons, we would eventually uh, find the mother and we would find the other two brothers. It's a huge gamble and they won't know if they can trust him until it's too late. We were in custody of a sentenced federal prisoner. If Jerry had fled, it would have been a huge embarrassment 
uh, to us and it would have been no end of trouble. But the DEA feels it's their only choice. Gomez sets up a meeting in California with Griselda Blanco's youngest son, 24-year-old Dixon Trujillo. Initially, Jerry was able to interest him in the proposition. Dixon was ready to take the bait. Wearing a wire, Gomez keeps his cool. And Dixon Blanco doesn't appear to know he's being set up. He even gives away that his mother is always on the move between Miami and L.A. But he is no more specific than that. At the end of the meeting, the team can't tell if they've done enough to trick Dixon into drawing his mother from her lair. Three tense weeks later, Gomez gets a call. But it's not from Dixon Blanco. It's from the Black Widow herself. And she's taken the bait which was, of course, a huge breakthrough in the investigation because it not only provided hopeful conversation in which she would incriminate herself, but it also gave us the first lead I think we had as to her actual whereabouts. Griselda Blanco wants to meet Gomez, but she says she no longer operates out of Miami. She'd made things so dangerous for herself and her family that she too took up in, in California. Blanco invites Gomez to meet her in a Los Angeles hotel. To get Blanco to incriminate herself on tape, the DEA has to resist the temptation to arrest her on sight. Wired for the meeting, Gomez feels the pressure. There was concern that Jerry could slip up or Jerry could offend Griselda at, at any moment, or Jerry could be unmasked at any moment. And Jerry was terrified. But it's simply too late to pull out. As he sits alone with her, Gomez starts to fall apart. Jerry became totally incoherent. I mean, the conversation was muddled. He was so fearful, he could not string together two logical sentences. This isn't the type of man the Black Widow trusts. I think she smelled something pretty quickly. She was not going to trust him with money. She was not going to trust him with drugs. I mean, he simply was not going to be made part of her operation. Jerry's performance is a disaster for the DEA. We weren't going to get any more. We had what we had, and it was not a slam dunk. It was not a, you know, open and shut prosecution. But it was viable, and we went with it. Now the DEA has no choice but to sift through all of Gomez's recorded conversations for hard evidence they can use in a prosecution. Names of the key players, the location of the drugs, clues to the hiding place of the Black Widow herself. And it turns out their terrified informant has extracted a vital piece of information. The address of a Los Angeles distributor. Palombo obtains a warrant to search the property. In the course of reviewing the information gathered from the execution of one of the search warrants, they found a utility bill for 
uh, an apartment in Irvine. Palombo's instincts tell him this Irvine apartment is exactly the type of residence Blanco would use to lay low. It was an upscale but not elaborate apartment. But he has to act quickly before she pulls another disappearing act. After a decade-long manhunt, he cannot afford to let the Black Widow slip from his grasp again. Colombo decides to stake out the address they've traced in Irvine, California. He needs to confirm it is the Black Widow's hideout. As soon as she's spotted inside the property, Palumbo calls for backup. The fear was that if they could not affect the arrest then and there, they might never see her again. Chips roll in on this. No bodyguards, no booby traps. Her only protection, a weapon on the dresser. Just out of reach. Bob went directly up to Griselda and gave her a big kiss on the cheek. She demanded to know, what is that for? which Bob replied, that's because I'm so glad to see you. Because Bob had been hunting her for a decade. Within months, all three of Blanco's sons are captured in sting operations by the DEA. It's the culmination of over 10 years of dedication, bringing the most deadly female cocaine boss in history and her criminal family to justice. I think it was just real relief. Uh, I mean, it was a masterful operation, and to have rolled up Griselda and her three sons all at the same time was really an accomplishment. Charged in New York with drug trafficking offenses, Blanco serves 13 of a 15-year sentence in a federal jail. In 1994, She's put on trial in Florida for murder. But when a sex scandal between witness and prosecution becomes public, the prosecution is forced to cut a deal with Blanco. Blanco avoids death row. And with time already served, the murder rap adds just seven years. In 2004, she is released and deported to her native Colombia. Then she pulls her best disappearing act yet and stays hidden for more than five years. But that's not the end of the story.
At the age of 69, Griselda Blanco is dead. Gunned down by her own ruthless method. For the agents who spent a decade chasing her, it comes as no surprise. We were waiting for that news that Griselda was killed. The fact that she lasted so many years, that's exception. Griselda Blanco really was the perfect sociopath. 